Now, the first message more so had an emphasis on getting your eyes on Christ, right? But we all know the Bible. And the Bible has some verses that can be somewhat introspective. Is that not true? Right? The Bible is a very balanced book in many different ways. Wherever it's in balance, that's because God designed it to be that way. If you feel like there's too much about the wrath of God, that's not an imbalance. That's actually perfectly displaying the character of the Lord. And so, here a question is for you guys. After you have sinned against someone, how long does it take you to resolve that sin that was committed against an individual? Not just how long. Do you even feel a responsibility to do something about some sin that took place against a brother or a sister? Give me some verses that would show you that it's important that we keep, and I'm going to use this term, short accounts. Right? What I mean by an account is I sin against our brother, I just opened an account with him, and I, I, until I get that resolved, or at least attempt to get it resolved, whether he's going to receive that or not, I'm trying to have a short account. I'm trying to not perpetuate the offense versus my brother. And so there, there's multiple passages that speak about this, but what comes to your mind? Yeah, Matthew 5, what, 23? We could even just read that real fast in case someone is not is familiar with that, that text? I mean, this is an incredible verse that really speaks about um, the, the timeliness of this. Where's that at? I thought it was Matthew 5. Matthew 6? 5.23. Yeah, so if you're going to offer your gift at the altar, and you know, that... Again, you could think about a Jew going to offer a physical gift at an altar, but what would he find in Romans 12.1? What's true of us? Yeah, we're making spiritual sacrifices unto the Lord. And he makes a statement here, so if you're offering your gift at the altar, and there you remember. Don't you love that word? Remember. Isn't that how it is? <laughs> you forgot something. You legitimately forgot about something that happened and you're in the act of seeking to worship the Lord and you remember something. And don't despise having a good memory. Don't despise the fact that those things can come upon your conscience. That's actually a blessing. You remember that your brother has something against you. Notice, he doesn't say you have something against your brother. I mean, you guys realize that, right? Christ teaches us that even if I haven't sinned against you, if I know you have something against me, who's responsible to go and talk to the other individual? Well, me. Even though it wasn't my own sin, I hold a biblical responsibility to go to that other individual. And then he says this, if you're offering your gift at the altar, he doesn't say there you remember your brother has something against you, and so yeah, you'll worry about it in three days. Or you know, you finish offering the gift. What does he say? Leave your gift there before the altar. I mean, it's literally like you're dropping it right there before the altar. First, be reconciled to your brother. Then, come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you're going with him to court. And he goes on. But yeah, I think that's, that's one of the places. Where's another place that speaks about the, yeah, Ephesians 4. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. And we're going to look at that verse very specifically tonight. So we'll think about that in a minute. What's another verse? Matthew 19. How many times should you forgive? Yeah, so you, your point there, I guess, you know, you can't, you can't, guys, you can't have an excuse that I can no longer have an account with this brother because I've already forgiven him 500 times. I still have a responsibility to make an effort. Right? Or let's think about husbands. You're going to prayer meeting, 
and your wife said something in the car and you get impatient with your wife, what verse comes to your mind when that happens? Yeah, deal with your wives in an understanding way. Why? What's the reason? Is that really a big deal? I mean, come on, that's not that important. Can't we wait? Can't I just let that resolve that tomorrow morning? Yeah, for the sake of your prayers that they might not be hindered. I, I will have no expectation of any help from the Lord preaching right now or praying if I've just sinned against my wife out there and I've not acknowledged that. Now, what if you don't remember what you did? I remember years ago, Tim Conway was in Monterey preaching. He had, he had sinned against his wife. Uh, forget how it was. Kind of being impatient, unsympathetic towards her, not understanding. He went and he preached and God helped him. But it had not yet hit his conscience. And you know what happened before his next sermon? It hit his conscience. Wow, I really hurt my wife there. And you know what Tim didn't do? He didn't go to her. And he went up there and he preached. And brethren, he said God abandoned him in the pulpit. And when he got done preaching, he went down to his wife. He said, I felt abandoned. And she said something along the lines of, yeah, that's how I felt earlier today. <laughs> but you know, that's so kind of the Lord to not let us get away. At least you hope you're not getting away with offenses. Right? That could deal with how aware am I to sin in my conscience, right? What's another verse that deals with this reality of having, of having short accounts, of resolving things between one another? Okay, yeah, love covering a multitude of sins. So I, and that even speaks to the reality. There are things you cover, right, that you don't necessarily have to bring up to an individual. You're able to move on and it doesn't negatively affect your relationship with them. Because right? the Bible doesn't just say we're bound to feel like every little thing that ever happens, we have to get it all resolved. So if I can cover something and it doesn't affect my fellowship with someone, that's a blessing. What's another verse? You guys haven't mentioned my favorite verse yet. Yeah, that, and that, you know what? If Paul is putting that in a letter to a church, that all the more shows the urgency of he knows there's something happening there and he wants it to get resolved. Right? I mean, if things don't get resolved, what happens? It affects your relationship with someone. You might end up feeling resentment towards that individual. It affects the unity in the church. Okay, what's, but what's, what's my favorite verse on this? Something Paul said. Something Paul said. Okay, well, turn there real fast. Acts 24. Does anyone know what I'm about? What verse I'm about to mention? Anyone know what's in Acts 24? Give me a Like the Bible quiz earlier. <laughs> look at this. This is an incredible verse. I, I do want to primarily look at Ephesians 4 in a minute. Um, for a specific reason, but this verse right here, it, to me it is an astonishing verse, starting in verse 15. Having a hope in God, which these men themselves accept, that there will be a resurrection of both the just and the unjust. So you hear what he just talked about? What did Paul just talk about? A resurrection of the just and the unjust. In other words, what's he thinking about? When you think about the resurrection of the just and the unjust, what could that also be speaking about? Yeah, the judgment. Right? It speaks that way in John. It says to the resurrection of damnation or the resurrection of eternal life. Okay, so we just mentioned that. Look at verse 16. What's the first word in verse 16? So what's that mean? It's the word so could also be in view of this. In view of the resurrection of the just and the unjust. Look what the Apostle Paul says. He says, I always, doesn't say half the time, I always take pains to have a clear conscience. And then look who he says towards who? God and who? Man. I've known many a Christian who they find it's really easy to clear their conscience before God. You know where it's difficult? Clear, clear your conscience with man. Right? And you think about the conscience, it's kind of the idea of this 
this witness with inside of yourself that is speaking to you, it's either condemning you with what you're doing or it's approving you in what you're doing. And the conscience is not a perfect guide, right? Some have their conscience seared. Some have their conscience defiled because of former association with idols. Our conscience continually needs to be informed by the Word of God. And then we're going to have a sensitivity when we've done something that kind of puts a mark on it. Something doesn't seem to be right. And Paul says he always takes... What was the word he said? Pains. Why would he say pains? Yeah, it's hard. I mean, have you guys found it's easy to clear your conscience? It's humbling. You try to reason out of it and think about maybe why this isn't really necessary to clear my conscience in regards to this. Especially when you get converted and you have what happens in Matthew 5. You're trying to go worship the Lord and you remember the guy you didn't pay rent to 10 years earlier. Or you remember stealing something, and all of a sudden, yes, is your, or is, is, should there be no guilt screaming at your conscience because the blood of Christ has cleansed your conscience? Yes, that is true. But when you look at the life of the Apostle Paul, Paul doesn't just view the saint of the conscience as it's something that it's cleansed once and for all, and that's all that the Christian ever needs to have happen. Paul looks at there's an ongoing short accounts in seeking to resolve things that, that, that defile the conscience or cause the conscience to have something that it, it's kind of, as one brother said, it's like the metal detector. You're walking along and you walk through something and something beeps. Right? It beeps. And you want a conscience that beeps. Spurgeon said you don't want to be the fool who shot the watchdog, right? You kill the conscience, you kill the watchdog, you've got no one warning you. John MacArthur, he mentioned about a plane where the guy was flying it and the warning system kept going up saying pull up, pull up. And the pilot, for whatever reason, thought that the warning system was malfunctioning. You know what happened next? That plane rammed into a mountain and they all died, right? Many a, many a professing Christian has done this very thing. What does Paul say in 1 Timothy 1? Some by not keeping what? Have made a shipwreck of the faith. Yeah, a good conscience. Their aim being love and a good conscience. They've not kept that and they have made shipwreck. So that's, yeah, that's another one of the verses that speak about this. And so, you know, the Bible in general, what the Bible talks about us living like in a week period of life, a month period of life. What's the Bible really emphasize for us as Christians? We're living in the what? The day. Right? I mean, what, what verses speak about that? You're not thinking about tomorrow. You're thinking primarily about today. What verses talk in this way? Yeah, in James... Um, you know, if you say you'll go to such and such a city and trade and make a profit, you don't know what tomorrow brings. Your life is a mist, it's a vapor. Yeah, sufficient is the day for its own trouble. In Matthew 6, in, in Ephesians 4, you know, we're going to see that reality of the day. Uh, Hebrews 3.13. Exhort, yeah, today is the day of salvation. 2 Corinthians 5. Hebrews 3.13. Exhort one another when? Every day, as long as it's called the day, so that what doesn't happen? Okay, now here are the interesting questions. Who won't get hardened by the deceitfulness of sin? Is it talking about the person you exhort? Or is it talking about the one giving the exhortation? Or is it talking about both of them? Yeah, I'd say both. Too often we think of that verse that if I don't exhort my wife today, her heart could be hardened. But you know what? If I know what I need to exhort my wife on today and I refuse to do it, guess who else's heart is now about to get a little hardened? My own, because I've neglected a clear command of obedience and an impression from the Spirit of God. And James 4.17 says, For him who knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. And so even in Hebrews, it's all about today. In Matthew 6, it's about today. So turn... To Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4. And what these, brethren, what these passages have really done to me as a Christian is just showed me the vital importance of living in today in my walk with Christ with a clear conscience having short accounts with those that I have offended. Right? Not pushing stuff off, not procrastinating, but resolving these things 
in a timely manner. So timely, Jesus says, drop it and go and resolve. Go and deal with it. I mean, that's incredible. So Ephesians 4, verse 25, um, you know, in this whole area here, Paul is really speaking about uh, how we've been created after the likeness of God, verse 24. He's talking about putting on the new man. Right? And that, so you don't want to miss that in this. Remember, the Christian life is not, about, uh, not a bunch of don't do this, don't do that. There's such an emphasis on put on the new man and be who you are in Christ Jesus. So don't miss that reality. But look at verse 25. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor. Why should we speak the truth with our neighbor? Apparently he's talking about Christians here because he says this. For we are members one of another. Verse 26. Be angry. So, what, I mean, just pause there for a second. What does he mean, be angry? Obviously, there is a righteous anger and indignation. There are certain things that a Christian, if you feel cold towards it, you're actually sinning by feeling a lack of passion for that which God is passionate towards. Be angry and do not sin. And then look at what he says here. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. And then look what he says. Verse 27, and there's another conjunction. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. I mean, he's really giving an imagery of dealing with this when? Today. Right? Not tomorrow, not the next day. He's saying to deal with this today. It doesn't mean that, well, I need to wait until the sun goes down and then that's my opportunity to resolve this, this anger in my heart. And I think, you know, even in context here, He's not just talking about a sinful anger. He's obviously talking about a righteous indignation. You know what happens if you're righteously angry about something and you bring it into the next day? What happens sometimes with that righteous indignation? It can shift and become something that is now actually not really honoring to the Lord. But he says, be angry, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. If you do let the sun go down on your anger, what does it result in? Gives opportunity for the devil. So let's let's just let's think about this for a moment. Okay, here I've got a door, right? And the door is open, right? And I'm I'm about to head to bed. The sun is going down. I'm going to head to bed. I'm going to go hit the hay. And I, you know, I'm in my house. I'm checking around, and I see the front door is wide open. And this is not out in Utah. This is in the inner city of Vegas. This is the inner, inner city of San Antonio. And I see my door is wide open. What do you think I'm going to do? Close the door? And am I going to lock the door? What if I told you instead of doing that, I saw the door is open, and I went over here and I typed out a note on a piece of paper that invited Satan to come into my house and have further opportunity to tempt me and drive me into more sin, and I stuck that on the door, and I went to bed. What would you think about me if I did that? Okay, well, I'll tell you this. If any of you have had some sin in your heart towards another Christian, you've got some anger there, something that you're not resolving, and you go to bed, you know what Paul just said? You're doing that exact thing. And if you wouldn't do that in the physical realm because you're afraid of the physical danger that could come in, What's, what's, think of this question. What is a realm that is of greatest reality? Physical or spiritual? Spiritual. And we can say that because the spiritual realm, the soul, when, when we die, that soul is still going on. Right? So there's not this, this whole... It, it, should I be more afraid of the danger in the physical realm or the danger in the spiritual realm? Yeah, in the spiritual realm. And so if you look there, get at the verse, he says, do not let the sun go down on your anger... And give no opportunity to the devil. Implying, if you do let the sun go down on your anger, his implication is there. It's resulting in you're, you are giving opportunity. Or you could say it this way, you're giving a place for the devil. Right? The door is open. Satan, you can come in. You're giving him a place. Is, is, you know what can be troubling about that reality? That seems to imply what about the Christian? seems to imply that the Christian can face assaults from the devil. 
I mean, is that true? I mean, think of the very Son of God. What did Jesus face? Yeah, he faced temptations. And think of this, think of this. After his temptations in Luke's account, Luke 4.13, it's an incredible verse. It says this, it says, Satan ended every temptation, and then what did he do? Waited for a more opportune time. Isn't that interesting? So if I go to bed, and I'm not keeping a short account, I'm not resolving this, and God's caused me to remember it, I already have a devil, an adversary, looking for an opportunity. He's looking for an opportune time. So if I then swing open the door and I'm basically inviting him in, am I crazy or what? I'm not crazy? No, yeah. What? I am, yeah, I am. <laughs> that is scary. Yeah, it should be. It says in Deuteronomy, you shall give your hired worker his wages on the same day before the sun sets. For he is poor and he counts on it. You know what happens if they don't give him their wages on the same day? Lest he cry against you to the Lord and you be guilty of sin. Isn't that an interesting reality? Well, who's, if, if, if the Lord is pressing me that I've got some unresolved conflict and sin against a brother or sister in Christ, and I'm refusing to take pains to clear my conscience before God and man, and I'm allowing the sun to go down on the sinful, bitter resentment and anger towards a Christian, it, who's, who's, it's not the workers crying out against me. Who is crying out against me? And more specifically, in the context of Ephesians, who's crying out against you? <laughs> Ephesians 4.30 do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed. And have you, you guys felt that? Have you felt the subjective reality of grieving the Spirit of God? Where His presence, it's not near you as it was? And, and you know what he, he puts that in context with here? Corrupting talk. Right? He puts it in context here with these things. <laughs> Through sinful anger, I in one moment can grieve the Spirit. Just like that. And he doesn't, He's not as near. And there's something crying out inside of me. It's not right. It's not right. Um, all right, let me look. I have not used my notes, so let me look at my notes real fast to see here where. What am I not. Um, yeah, you've given them an opportunity by refusing to resolve issues of sin today. Uh, what's one of the greatest sins as a Christian? Starts with the letter P. Yeah, that's yeah, I'd agree with that. Another one was the letter P. Yeah, procrastination. And you know what? You're a teacher, right? You got students procrastinating. We don't want to be procrastinators, brethren. And Paul, actually, Paul, this is the same Paul that goes on later in Ephesians 6, and he talks about the spiritual warfare we're, we are involved in. If you just say, oh, I'm a Christian, this is great. You know, nothing can touch me. You don't want to go through life with that perspective. You could actually create an opportunity to have far more fierce temptation and trials from the devil. Um, all right. Yeah, this should make you realize Paul's theology. It doesn't mean that we're off limits to attacks of the enemy. Um, here's some questions. Have you guys ever read Jonathan Edwards? He had uh, 75 questions of examination. Have you guys ever heard of that? They're kind of, they're kind of scary questions. But they're not scary because a lot... I mean, I think all of them are really based on scriptural principles. But listen to just a few of these questions here. Do I overlook some sin in my life because it has become customary to me? What's, what's scary about that, you kind of think about, let's think about the topic of anger. All right? There is a righteous indignation, as Paul hits on, that you should feel towards many things. But if we're honest, what do you and I struggle more with? Is it not being righteously angry enough? Or is it being sinfully angry? Sinfully angry. Yeah, I mean, that's where I'm at. 
I don't look at my life and think I need more righteous indignation. I mean, I, I probably do. I do, right? We don't have a perfection of that holy indignation for God's passion as we should. But our greater struggle can be towards sinful anger. And he says here, look, I overlook, do I overlook some sin in my life because it's become customary? I mean, think. Is there something in your life that has kind of become customary that you don't even pick up on it? Maybe think about it even in the area of anger. Impatience. Anger. Impatience. Not to, and I don't even want to bring out the, the name of the, 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 the individuals, but one of the brothers here recently visited uh, another group, right? And they expressed how they witnessed a lot of the people over there were really being angry, but it was kind of like it was normal. Why, why was it normal over there for them to get up and say things that were too harsh and too angry? Or, why, why is that customary over there? You know, yeah, it's not dealt with, and then guess what? It doesn't get dealt with again, and there can be a subtle, Hebrews 3.13, a hardening happening. And then you got a whole group of people, kind of like we saw this morning, right? 72 people rejoicing in the wrong thing, and they don't even pick up on it. So you can have that same thing happen here. Listen to this. Do I allow myself to commit some sin because it is not widely condemned among my fellow man? Or because I see it done by my peers? Well, I mean, the leaders over there who are my peers, they're doing these things, so this must be justifiable. These are Jonathan Edwards' questions. Um, well, this, this passage here in Ephesians 4 uh, is actually from a psalm. What psalm is this from? Well, Psalm 4.4. 4 says, be angry and do not sin. And that's the exact, in the Septuagint, it's the exact same words as be angry and do not sin. And listen to this. Psalm 4.4, be angry and do not sin. Ponder in your hearts on your beds and be silent. Selah. Now, the way that is worded in English to me, it kind of doesn't make sense initially, but this might help. The word silent it's the same word in Acts 2.37 when it says they heard what was said and they were cut to the heart. What led to their silence? The Word. They're cut to the heart. So in other words, Psalm 4.4, it's basically saying be fearful of the Lord if you're cut to the heart and do not be dismissive. Right? Don't be dismissive of it. Don't be dismissive of that thing that happened. And when did it happen according to Psalm 4.4? When He was doing what? At what time of the day? And when he's laying on his bed. Isn't that kind of interesting? Because right here in Ephesians, he's talking about the sun going down. And so, no doubt, Paul most likely knew of Philippians, or, uh, Psalm 4.4, 4, Ponder in your own hearts on your beds and be cut to the heart. Do not be dismissive of that by which... You know, it, might be dis it could be talking about don't be dismissive of the thing you should feel righteously angry about and what you need to go prophetically say to a group of people. It could be that. But do you ever ponder things on your bed? Do you ever do spiritual inventory? And have you ever been doing that on your bed, and it's late, and you're tired, and something comes to your mind? And I realize, well, tell me if I'm right or not. I realize, you know, it's late. Probably should worry about it another day, right? You know, I can just wait a couple days, work up some courage. Is that right? Is that wrong? What, I mean, what type of flavor do you get from some of the verses we've looked at? It adds more of an urgency to it. So look, I'd much rather err on urgency. I realize there are really complicated situations where you're just wrestling before the Lord and you need clarity and you need time. Um, but the, the text is loudly saying, keep everything present and current. The sin you have today is to be dealt with to day. Yeah, I've been keeping the door open. You're right. I better shut this. Let's lock it too. Uh-oh, it won't lock. Um, what should motivate you to do this? I mean, look at what Paul goes on later to say. 
Be kind to one another, verse 32. Tender-hearted, why? Forgiving one another, what's the motivation? Yeah, God, I mean, again, it just always comes back to the Gospel, doesn't it? You can't, you can't look at Paul taking pains to clear his conscience. You can't look at Paul saying, don't let the sun go down on your anger. You can't look at Jesus saying, leave the offering and just make this some work and thing you've got to do. Out of love for Christ and your own relationship with Him and not grieving Him, isn't it kind of something you just naturally want to do? No? Why don't you feel that in your own soul? Now, it's not possible that you and I could be ignorant of the schemes of the devil. Right? That's not, that couldn't be the case. Right? Paul tells the church at Corinth, do not be ignorant of the schemes of the devil. What's that imply? Yeah, you can be. What does Paul say at the end of the Romans 16? He talks about the hearts of the... Whose hearts are getting deceived? The hearts of the naive. I mean, we can't be naive, can we? Who here is naive and there's things they don't realize? Yeah, everyone better be raising your hand because you've not uh, reached glorification yet. But the motivation, again, it's all back to Christ. It's amazing. Proverbs 15, a soft answer turns away wrath. But a harsh word stirs up anger. A harsh word stirs up anger. You hear that? A soft answer. The, the tone of your voice matters and communicates something to people. So imagine, here an example is, right? You, got, you know, what, you know what I, how I want to live as a Christian? I want to live not having to go back and clear my conscience with people. Right? I don't want that to have to be what needs to happen. And uh, Hudson Taylor, he, you know, when he was in China, he dressed like a Chinese man. And Hudson Taylor was going to get onto a boat, and some rich Chinese man, you know, Hudson didn't look like an American, so he bulldozed Hudson Taylor to the ground, and he landed into the mud. How do you think he responded? And maybe ask this first. Is how he, does how he respond have a massive implication on anything? What has the implication on what? Number one, his own personal walk with Christ. Number two, his own witness of the gospel of Christ to that lost Chinese man. And I'm sure we could add some other things that are implied by how he responds in that situation. You know what Hudson Taylor did? Was he irritated? By the grace of God, he wasn't irritated. He got up, he invited the man on the boat, and he got to evangelize the man. Did he know that trial was coming? Did he know as he's walking down that some guy's going to ram him into the mud? He had no idea. And brethren, that's how our trials are. I mean, when I get tested in the area of anger, I did not expect that to happen. Or in patience. Uh, love is patient. Love is kind. Right? We want to be people who have a gentleness. We want to have the holy passion and anger of God over that which we should. But we don't want to be giving in to sinful impatience or anger. And if we do, you know what we need to do? We need to go and apologize. I mean, I can't, you know, many a time I have been impatient with my kids and I recognize it. And you know what I do? I sit them down and I'm very specific to apologize to them and how I sinned against them. You know what's one of the motivations? Because I don't want to give an opportunity for the devil. And what does that even mean, give an opportunity for the devil? For one, if you've grieved the Spirit as a Christian, what are you now giving opportunity even to happen? You're not having as much what? Spiritual clarity. I mean, think how David felt. How did David feel when he was in the midst of his sin? After he had sinned with Bathsheba. Yeah, Psalm 32. Day and night your hand was heavy upon me, while strength is dried up as by the heat of the summer, his bones were wasting away. That's not a your sin does not put you in a place where you have greater mental clarity to make decisions. It puts you in a place where you don't have that clarity. Where you don't recognize these things. You know, have you heard the saying, he has a short fuse? What does that mean? 
Yeah, quick tempered. You know what Christians should have? I mean, they should have a fuse. It's so long. <laughs> now, over that which dishonors God, you should have a righteous anger quicker, not later. But the more I grow and seek to love the Lord Jesus Christ and trying to love my family and the brethren, I mean, especially the church. The church, one of the beautiful things about the church is you've got to bear with one another in love and you're going to hurt each other and offend each other. And you've got to do what? You've got to resolve it. And that takes work to do that. Um, I, you know, I even remember Bob Jennings, when he was dying of cancer, he had preached two weeks earlier, or no, three weeks before he died. The very next Sunday, he got up and he apologized publicly. And he said, in my last sermon from a Sunday earlier, he said, I realized I made a point that was true, but I said it in too harsh of a way. And he asked the body to forgive him. I mean, I was there for that. That was incredibly impactful on my life because you saw a man who didn't want to sin against the Lord and have anything impact his relationship with Christ. Which again, it, my relationship with Christ is going to impact my relationships with who? Everybody. Primarily from 1 Peter, we see it affects your relationship with your wife. Right? Um, there's a whole lot more that that could be said here. Um, I'm sorry if I didn't, I kind of hopped right in there in Ephesians 4 and I didn't maybe exposit it or dig into some of those phrases as much. But let's think for a moment how all this applies in marriage. How do you know you really have a good Christian marriage? I mean, there's a lot of people who say they got a good Christian marriage. Do they really have it? I know of a pastor who I used to pastor with, his wife just took the six kids and left him six weeks ago. It was very shocking. She, the woman is the one who really has the sin. She's full of anger. I never would have expected their marriage was where it was at. It was kind of a wake-up call to me. Where are people in my flock's marriages really at? I mean, this is a guy I co-pastored with for years. But in a way, he would wrongly cover for his wife too much and not confront her on certain things that needed to be dealt with. And eventually, it goes on long enough, what happens? The little hill becomes a massive mound and it causes problems. I mean, how do you know your home is functioning like a Christian home? I've seen families that have, they got six kids in a row sitting still for two hours in a meeting holding their hands. And what, what led to that? What led to that? It might have been some very consistent and godly parenting. You know what it also might be? It might be some morbid fear and a domineering leadership over these children that's kind of crushed them into a point of fear to where that's what's motivating the obedience, right? The same thing can happen in, in the church. You got a lot of churches where people's obedience is just based out of fear. Um, think about David. How, I mean, how did David, how did David get into the sin of adultery? What was one of the first sins he committed that led to that? Yeah, not going to war. Well, what happened before he went? Did not go to war. You know what happened before that? They had a major battle. It was a big battle. They won it. You know how many battles they had left, if I remember right? They had one more battle. One more battle is an easy victory. Do you know what David did? Didn't matter to him that that custom was there, that this is the time that kings go to war. David stayed around, right? And that his misuse of his time led into um, this. I don't know why I mentioned that. That doesn't exactly... I guess... It, why do I have that in my notes here? <laughs> yeah, it is a valid point to think about. But I guess just again, just recognizing in the same way, a little anger here, even against, say, one of my children, and I don't resolve that, or against one of you, and I don't resolve that, Paul says the result is you give opportunity for the devil. Does that bother you? Does that bother you that Satan is out there looking for an opportunity to test you? 
You can say, but Christians, you know, they can't be possessed. I'm not talking about you being possessed by the devil. I'm talking about having an oppression and an intense warfare, even on your thoughts, and going into a realm of lack of clarity in the spiritual realm, because in your pride, you've refused to resolve something that's happened. You know it's happened. The Lord has caused you to remember that it's happened. And then it leads to bitterness and resentment, and then that just kind of becomes the customary thing. And you don't even recognize the path to apostasy that you're now on. Think of this. What happens when a husband gets angry with a wife and they don't resolve it? Does that create another open door for the devil anywhere? Where? No, no, give me a text. If I'm angry with my wife and I and just my pride, I don't want to acknowledge it, you know, I'm right, you're wrong, honey, let's go to bed. Well, what's one of the last things that couple is going to engage in that evening? Intimacy. And what does Paul say in 1 Corinthians 7? Listen to this. Do not deprive one another except perhaps because you're really angry at one another and you just want to get to bed. Is that what it says? Do not deprive one another except perhaps by what? Agreement. Agreement for a limited time that you may devote yourself to prayer, but then come together again lest what happen? so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. So, brethren, think of this. If I get angry with my wife and I don't apologize to that, it's not just that I've now created a situation where there's an opportunity for my own spiritual life to be affected, but now with this wedge between my wife and I, and say it goes on and on and there's a lack of, of physical intimacy there, now that other spouse might be tempted to lack self-control and go to someone else. Right? If I'm not meeting my wife's emotional needs, you know what's going to happen? She could fall into emotional adultery with another man who's a better talker than I am, and they could talk it up, and they could have a nice time, and they could start to fill some friendship and companionship. Before you know it, their heart's been given to another individual. Um, he doesn't say don't come together because the reason of anger. But if there's anger unresolved, these things can happen. Well... Um, what else here? Maybe here a thought is on, just a quick thought on marriage and intimacy. It's kind of the one thought I give to any young couple who's getting married, and maybe you guys have heard this. But think of this. In the marriage bed, the spouse is seeking to bring the other spouse to a point of satisfaction, and they're serving them. It's a ministry opportunity, right? It's, a mini it's not about what I can get. It's about giving of my spouse and serving them to get them to a point where they have been satisfied. And when you realize that, if you have anger against your spouse, you know what's going to happen? You're not going to be able to fulfill one of those ministries towards your spouse because you feel resentment towards them. You don't feel affection towards them. You feel resentment toward, towards them. Um, well, here are a couple more examples are that have been an impact to me that kind of deal with this, this whole idea of always taking pains to have a clear conscience. And maybe I'd even ask this. Is it possible to do what Paul is saying in Acts 24.16? Is that possible? Give me, there's two verses I can think of that show that it's possible. I'm sure there's more. Yeah, 1 Corinthians 4.4, 4, Paul says, I don't know of anything against myself. I am not thereby acquitted, for it is the Lord who will judge me. So he's acknowledging. There might be things I don't recognize. What's another one? Hebrews 13. He's dealing with the elders in context, and he says, pray for us. I think he's talking about the elders in the church. Pray for us, for we are sure, what? We are sure that our consciences are clear. Isn't that amazing? He gives that as a reason and appeal for prayer. Pray for us, for we are sure that our consciences are clear. So this is a possible realm 
to live in by the grace of God. Well, here's some, some other examples are. You guys know who Keith Green is? Yeah, Keith Green. Well, George Verwer, and I think this is in Leonard Ravenhill's biography. I think that's where I got it. But um, someone mentioned a Keith Green album, and George said, yeah, it's great. Yeah, it's a great album. Well, I had listened to some of Keith's music, but I had not listened to that album. So in comes Keith to the prayer time. And I was so convicted that I had not been honest about that little detail that I pulled Keith aside and I said, Keith, I need to repent for what I said to you yesterday. I broke down in tears of repentance because I could not be dishonest even in a subtle little thing like that when I was with those men. Do you guys desire to live like that? No, not really. Yeah? This goes back to, again, your own closeness with Christ. If that's the great source of your joy, you will find yourself going to any length and extent to protect that intimacy that you have with the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? This isn't all about my relationship with my wife, my relationship with the brethren. Yeah, that's a byproduct of my relationship with Christ being in a good place. Here, here an example is of a, a brother just from two weeks ago in our church. <laughs> he was at my house and I thought, hey, that's a good, good sermon illustration here. Um, so he had basically sent, they had sent him the address on how to get to, uh, or he didn't have the address to get to their house. And he asked for the address. And instead, he went and texted me and asked for the address. And they never saw the message till they were in the middle of Bible time. And they said, oh, you remembered how to get to our house. Sorry we didn't respond to your message and give the address. And the brother said, yeah. Well, what did he just agree with in that statement? And that's not true. And it hit him. That was not honest of me. And so the brother... He apologized in the Bible time towards them. And you know what's incredible, brethren? In the middle of that family that night, there was a young girl who for the last 10 years, her whole entire life was a lie. She was lying about everything, lying about illnesses, lying about health problems, lying about things that had happened to her. She, she was just lying and lying. And she, she sat there and saw that brother apologize for such a tiny thing, right? but it's not really tiny, that was incredibly convicting for her. He had no idea that was happening. And that young girl, even just a week later, after 10 years, just completely exposed herself and started confessing all of these lies that had happened in her life. You see, brethren, the small things, those small actions can have a massive impact. On your children... I mean, to lead in a humble way with the church, with the children, it's, it's so important. And here another example is this one. I, I, I don't remember what was preached on Sunday in Sedalia, Missouri, about, ten, uh, no, about nine years ago. But I remember in their open meeting, a 70-year-old woman got up and confessed something to the whole church. She was a woman that was involved in leading uh, the women's prayer meeting and maybe given a little teaching before the prayer meeting. I don't know what was preached that day. But she got up and she mentioned how she was driving down in the city in her van, um, going back to her house, and she saw these incredible flowers at someone's house. And she stopped the car, she went up, she knocked on the door. No one answered. She's looking at the buds all right there. And she reasoned in her mind, they won't care if I just take one of those off. Right? You're on someone else's property. And she, yeah, a flower or a bud? Am I not using the right term? Oh, no, oh, oh, yeah, it's some type of flower bud, so okay. she could go plant that and create her own, right? Or raise her own, or whatever term is there. Um, she said she put that thing on her dashboard, and as she was driving home, she, she could not believe. Here, I've taught my children not to lie. Here, I've said all of these things. And here, look what I'm doing right here in this small little way. And she said this. I remember saying this. You don't want to have a defiled conscience over something, over anything. But here I was willing to give up that joyful relationship with the Lord just because I had justified it in my mind. 
you know, she turned around, went back, put the bud back, and she wrote a note and apologized to that person. And you know what that person's response was when they called her up? Oh, that wasn't a big deal. See, that's how, that's how people are, right? Oh, that's not a big deal. Is it a big deal? Is a clear conscience a big deal? Is not leaving the door open a big deal? It is. And I get it. You know, some of us were too introspective. We could take these things to some, some extreme and you could fall into analysis paralysis. I get that. I, I understand that. And I understand there's different situations and I understand there's times you don't know what to do. And you, you should go to one of your pastors and you should explain the situation. You know, I've had like five guys come to me in our church and talk about how they cheated through college and they wanted to know what they needed to do. Um, Daniel Rowland, used in the Welsh Revivals, he said this, You are aware of the mark at which Satan and all his archers aim their shafts. It is at your conscience void of offense and your holy life and conversation that all the mad and raging fury of earth and hell is leveled at that very thing. So brethren, if, if I go to your house, I hope I don't find the doors open at night and you've got a sign on there inviting Satan to come in and tell him you've got a place for him to have an impact in your life. You don't want him to have an impact on your life. He is a slanderer. He is seeking to divide. He is seeking to destroy. He is seeking to poison your minds. He's seeking to get you to have resentment that's unresolved. Well, I think that was all I had. Um, one other thing I thought about. I, I recently ran into... 35 questions that Jim Elif, he's a pastor in Kansas City, he has 35 questions for maturing a Christian marriage. They're really good. I thought about sharing that in the retreat um, WhatsApp, if you pastors are okay with me doing that. But look, some of these, you know, they're really, they're really good and heart, heart-searching questions. And... Um, The Bible, where, where's the passage where someone prays for the CIA and the FBI to invade their house, download their hard drive, and search everything? Where's that passage at? The FBI and the CIA are representing the Lord. Yeah. Yeah, Psalm 139, 34, or 23 to 34. 24, search me, O God, try my heart, try my mind, and do what? And then do what? Lead me in the way everlasting. All right, I mean, that, brethren, I don't want this message to be something that makes you feel like some sort of, of bondage, but honestly, you will end up in bondage by not living out these principles because you're going to give opportunity for the devil, and you're going to be the person who doesn't even recognize what's happening. Oh, I lost sensitivity. Did, did I, have I been touching the stove again and again and searing my conscience? What, what happened here? It doesn't feel hot. All right, let's pray.